Hello, and welcome to the Science Bloggers Podcast. I'm your host, David Latchman, and today my guest is Wes Wilson. Wes is a scientist studying mesothelioma and how the immune system can be used against this deadly disease. Wes explains why some cancers are so difficult to treat and why new treatments are needed. Wes also happens to be a science communicator with over 15 years experience and he has been a blogger before owning a blog was a thing. Wes takes us along his journey as a science communicator and offers advice to newcomers interested in joining the field. Yes, hello Wes, how are you? I'm quite well, thanks for having me. So, you're in Australia and I'm in California, so it's kind of like a weird time difference that we have here, because it's very early morning for me. And it's late night here, and it's late on a Sunday. Just finishing up some work for tomorrow, because tomorrow's another day. Well, I'm, I'm glad we finally got to, to do this, because I know we had like a few misses before we finally got to where we are today. That's true. We should have used that one of those dating apps that have misconnections and stuff that we could have got together sooner. Yeah, probably we should start one one day. So why don't you tell our listeners something about, about yourself? What do you do? Sure. Uh, so I'm Wes Wilson. Um, I'm a Canadian originally. Uh, born and raised in Ontario. I'm currently doing cancer research here in Western Australia, looking at um, some playing with different immunotherapies and uh, trying to figure out different ways to get the body to fight hard to treat cancers. So I'm currently working in mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the pleural lining of the lungs uh, and most commonly associated with asbestos exposure. And uh, it's a very tricky one to treat. Um, it grows near a lot of critical structures, which can cause, makes cutting it out surgically quite difficult. And a lot of our chemotherapy compounds just aren't very effective. Um, through the course of the last clinical trials in the last decades or so, um, look, the best treatment we have is kind of a combination of these two chemotherapy agents, but they only really extend life by about two months, unfortunately. And uh, radiotherapy, which is quite effective against many kinds of tumors. It's used in 60% of all solid tumor treatments, both new and reoccurrent. Um, The lungs themselves, near where these mesotheliomas grow, uh, is very sensitive to radiotherapy, and the lungs can fibrose, and they'll die sooner than the tumors will, unfortunately. So it's not usually used in a curative fashion. It is sometimes used um, palliatively. If a tumor is to spread somewhere, that is painful. If a tumor spreads to a rib, so forth, this can cause patients a lot of pain. You can treat that with radiotherapy and uh, kill the tumor that way. So the tumors themselves are actually sensitive to radiotherapy. They're just in hard-to-reach places. Um, And so one of the things we're trying to do is, can we augment this radiotherapy approach from a palliative point of view, combine it with with, um, modern-day immunotherapy, uh, which is a way of getting the immune system to fight the cancer, and um, can we turn these uh, kind of treatment options into a systemic therapy? And that's kind of what I do here from a science perspective. And of course, I am a science communicator. Um, Maybe hopefully some of your listeners have seen our pages. We are at facebook.com slash mostly science. And of course, the website mostly science.com. And we have a new podcast, uh, which is on iTunes and Google Podcasts. And now, finally, approved on Spotify. So all those listeners out there on Spotify. Uh, That one took a while, but we're there now. All right, that sounds great. So in your TEDx talk, right, and you go sort of in depth into cancer and and cancer treatment. Um, So why is it some cancers are good with the traditional um, treatment? And why is it that we need to use the immune system to to combat some some cancers? You know, what, what makes them so different? That's a good question. And I mean, I think there's more than one reason for that. Um, But I mean, the main reason is that cancer is uh, not a homogeneous disease, right? It's, it's a set, it's a set of diseases um, that are very different from one another. So some things that some cancers that do respond to certain compounds, you know, other cancers will not. Um, A good example of that is some of the, the targeted therapies that have come out in the last decade. Uh, Gleevec, uh, Herceptin, these are uh, chemotherapy agents for breast cancer. Um, they, were, they target specifically receptors found only on these uh, breast cancers. And those, tumor, those, those receptors are not found on other tumors, but they're also not found on normal healthy tissue, which is why those kind of compounds are, tend to be 
less toxic than something like cyclophosphamide or doxorubicin, which are chemotherapy agents that are toxic to every cell in your body, really. And that's what it, and that's kind of the core of what makes it cancer so hard to treat sometimes is that cancer cells are your own cells. And because of that, a lot of our treatment options can hurt your own cells as well. And we try to use properties of cancer and properties of tumors to try to make it more selective. So in the case of targeted therapies, we try to look at ones that have receptors that are just only on tumors, or in the cases where they're not targeted, at least show preferential treatment. So some of these compounds are really good at destroying DNA, and they can only do that when the DNA is dividing. And while many of your cells divide at different rates, tumor cells tend to be dividing faster. And so it's more selective to those dividing cells. I see. Why is it so difficult to, to study cancer treatments and cures? You know, I, I had a friend who was uh, survived cancer two times. And, you know, one, one of the things he was like telling me is, is in, in rats or mice, yeah, we have cured cancer several times or several types of cancers. But when you translate that research to humans, it's, it's completely different, you know? So why is that? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and um, it, and it's, it's a very convoluted process. There's a lot of variables at play when you're talking about anything in the biological context. And sometimes it's that the models are different. Um, so you can think of trying to study, you know, trying to study the immune system in yeast isn't really going to be very useful. And different animals, and different species have different immune systems and they have different, there's things that are unique to them. And those differences can sometimes be the difference in a treatment working if it, if it uses the immune system, for example, like immunotherapy really relies on the immune system to work. But that's true of a lot, of a lot of therapies. We know that the immune system plays a role in how some chemotherapy agents work. We know it plays a role in bystander effects with radiotherapy. Um, and we also know that different um, species can metabolize different drugs differently too. So we, you know, many, you know, many species have livers. That's not unique to humans. But the way and the ability to process compounds and drugs can be tricky as well. So we've decided as a society that it would be unethical to experiment in humans. This is something we've come to, we've come together and we've accepted that that is, that's how it was. And this wasn't always the case. Um, it only, even like in the late seventies, like there were still groups sort of experimenting on humans in a way that was unethical without their consent. And, um, and, and there may, that may be true in other parts of the world as well, where there's still sort of unethical stuff going on. There was, there was a whole stem cell issue in the early two thousands in China where some of the harvesting practices of embryos were tended to be a little unethical as well. But, that once we decide that we can't do these new therapies and we're not sure what the outcomes are going to be in humans, we have to get preclinical data first, that's always going to be one barrier. And the kinds of cancers we treat in these animal models, they, can, they only represent a single patient, right? So if you were to take a tumor from a patient and you put it into an immunocompromised mouse model, let's say, so you could grow a human model in a mouse, so we call these like xenografts um, or xenographic models, and, um, and when you do that, and let's say you figure out a treatment, you put it like in a thousand mice, you figure out a treatment and, you know, you got it working and it cures the cancer. You have to remember, even though you've done it in a thousand mice, that was still just one tumor from one patient. You've basically just cured one person and the heterogeneity of the, of these tumors, the, the fact that they're different, even from patient to patient, the fact that two different people can have the same type of lung cancer, but one of them responds to therapy and the other one doesn't. There's differences that are unique to, to cancers within the individual. And when you show something works in a, in a mouse model, you've only shown it works in one patient, essentially. And that's why a lot of papers will try to show the same thing in multiple models, right? They'll try to show it in one species of mouse and a second species of mouse and maybe three different cancer lines in one of the mice and you know, try to make it more robust to show that it's more applicable. And sometimes these translate. Sometimes there's too many differences uh, metabolic, metabolically. Um, and there's other hindrances too that go the other way from humans to mice. So for an example, some of the side effects of treatment, for example, which, um, you know, um, like diarrhea, anti anemic drugs we can give to compensate for some of the side effects, you don't work in mice. So if a mouse starts losing too much weight, it can die from that if the chemotherapy drugs you're giving are causing too much of a weight loss. And there isn't a same way to compensate for those side effects like you can in humans. And therefore, those treatments always fail mouse experiments, and they never get tested in humans. And so 
it, it goes both ways back and forth. There are limitations to our modeling. Um, and But those are the limitations that we're kind of stuck with. We can study, we're very good at studying cancer. We're studying it more and more all the time. Technology is allowing us to do you know, single cell RNA sequencing on, on larger scales, much, much cheaper. And it's not about, it's hard to study cancer. It's just that cancer is very complicated. And the systems involved are very complicated. And there's so many variables at play that that's what's stopping us towards that. The second part of your question was, why haven't we kind of cured it? Why can't we just get a cure? And it's because it's such a complicated environment, it's such a complicated system, and we're in very complicated individuals. There's just a lot of variables. Wow, it, it sounds like the, the biochemistry behind everything is just so, you know, crazy, it's so different. Not just across, like, one species to the other, but, but also across two individual human beings. It, you know, oh, for sure. I mean, we different people are able to process different things and toxins in a different way. Um, it's the same reason why some people can, you know, you get you always hear stories of people who've smoked 20 cigarettes a day for, you know, 50 years and, you know, they never get lung cancer. But then you get other people, you know, where one cigarette and, you know, their cells aren't able to expel those toxins properly and they develop cancer, you know, with much less exposure. So we talk about like safe of exposure levels and we talk about all these different things. They're generally for they're generally an average of you know from a population. There's always going to be some people who are more or less susceptible to different things, and that's true of all of our biology, all the epigenetics, all the everything about us, even our metabolism. You you know, it's, there's we're not all on the same same level. Yeah. So so going to that part where you, you're talking about the the immune system and expelling toxins, right? Um, yeah, we when, should probably not use the word toxin. It's uh, not a great word. Um, they say the more you use toxin, the more you don't understand chemistry. I, uh, I, I, I took pol- poetic, uh, poetic license using the word toxin a second ago. Okay. Um, well, but you know what I meant. I meant harmful chemicals within cigarettes. Okay, well, okay, ha- harmful chemicals, right? I mean, wh- wh- when we look at asbestos, right, it's, it's kind of like yep. the uh, spiky crystalline structure. And, you know, when it gets into the lungs, it kind of like really digs in, it latches on to, to the tissues. Is is that the reason why it's it's so difficult for the body to expel? And is that the reason why it eventually defa- turns into cancer? Yeah, it's definitely, that's one of the reasons. So for asbestos fibers, and for those who aren't, who aren't familiar um, listening, asbestos is, it's a mineral, it's a naturally occurring mineral that we mine out of, out of the earth. Um, it's got some amazing properties to it. Um, you know, it's very heat resistant. You know, it makes a good insulator. It's very, very strong. It's light. Um, and, you know, it has all these amazing properties. And that's why we used it for everything for a while there, because it could be used for everything. Um, and when it does, f- like, flake off and become particulates and gets in the air, there is this sort of what we call, like, a Goldilocks size particle. And that is where if the particles and the fibers are too large, they don't make it down into the lungs. They get stuck along the way. And if they're too small, um, they can be, the body can kind of segregate them out and remove them. In, but if they're the perfect size, this Goldilocks zone size of fragment, then yes, they get stuck in there. The body cannot remove them. They can still get into the lungs. And the longer they are there, the more DNA damage can be accumulated. And it's a process that takes time. And that's why... When you're exposed to asbestos, when the miners are exposed or the people who are manufacturing and working with the products were exposed, that's why there's such a lag period between exposure of asbestos to mesothelioma. And it's like 20 to almost, in some cases, 40 years after exposure. It takes a long time. It's a slow process. It's a long lag period. Wow. Let's let's talk about some of your science communication. You, you said that you've let's been... Do it. You've been doing this for what, 10 to 15 years or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing it for a little over 15, but maybe... So when I started, when like, so I, we, I started online back in the, early, the late 90s, and we just, you know, me and my friends, we were all coders, and we had our own little websites, and we all had our own little web presence that were on the, the slew of free web servers that were out there during that period of time before the, the dot-com bubble bust. And, um, you know, we're, we're just kids, though, you know, we're just in grade school. And what are we putting on there? You know, we're putting on jokes, you know, we're, you know, like, you know, those things you feel used to get like email chains of like really bad jokes, like we were, we were doing that kind of stuff. Shitty yeah, jokes I online. That, yeah. 
Yeah. And so, and then, you know, as you know, before, just before like live journal and blogger came out, like we were, we were sort of kind of blogging before we knew blogging was a word. And that was what all our friends were doing. And they come high school, everyone's got live journal, everyone's got blogger. And we're just, you know, now, now everyone's blogging every single day. And, you know, I was always interested in science. I knew from a young age that I wanted to go into STEM. And so I was journaling or blogging about the science and interesting things that I found interesting. And so I didn't know it then, but I was doing a little SciComm then in high school. And then I guess I didn't take it on as like a serious thing. Like, I, like as I went into university, I studied biochemistry in my undergrad. Um, you know, I was still, you know, had a personal blog, but I was just blogging about biochemistry stuff. And it wasn't until my second year of undergrad where I made the conscious effort to start a site about specifically about a STEM topic. So before it was a little, it was just a story of my life. My life happened to involve science. And then me and my roommate, uh, Peter, and a friend, a couple of friends from high school, uh, including uh, Alex McCarthy, uh, we were, we started this like online, like tech journalist site. It was like Engadget before Engadget kind of. And um, it was like, this was before Facebook. And um, that was our first like real forte, like for, foray into sci- SciComm and, into sci- and communicating science. And we had tutorials and we had, we talked about things and, you know, to discuss things that were like ethical and changes within technology. And that ran for about a year. And then, you know, we were in undergrad, so school got busy. And, you know, my roommate Peter moved away. He switched to universities, the University of Toronto. Um, and then we, you know, the site kind of disappeared. And then I got really into podcasts, uh, just listening to podcasts. And I thought, hey, I'm going to start my own science podcast. Um, and then so I, I started my own science podcast. It's called Inside Science, uh, where I'd interview various uh, researchers, uh, mostly in Ontario. I drove to different places. Uh, I, I interviewed um, evolutionary biologists at the University of Toronto in Toronto. I interviewed um, ecologists in uh, University of Windsor. I talked to amazing astrophysicists um, at Western University in London, Ontario. We kind of like had a little road show driving around interviewing people. And that was really fun for a while. And then school got busy and then it fell apart again. Um, and then I had another attempt. I had another podcast in 2008, 2009-ish, when I was overseas doing some postgraduate studying in medicine in in Dublin. And um, it was called like Minute Medcast was the name of that show. And I would just interview physicians and get like little medical tidbits and facts. And that one was more with a target audience of mind of other people in health sciences. So it was more targeted towards, you know, people who are already studying health sci or nursing or something like that. Um, so that was more of a niche audience, but then again, school got busy and, uh, ended that. And I kind of just went back to blogging until 2012, uh, when I thought I met a whole bunch of other students and a bunch of these students were very interested in getting involved in science communication and especially science blogging. And, but they didn't know how to code. They couldn't make a website. They didn't know where to do it, how to do it. They didn't have the time to necessarily consistently blog. So they could do like one post, maybe a month, but that wouldn't be enough to make their own website for. And so I had this idea to make this communal site, a site where all these kind of students, postdocs, even researchers who, you know, thought about, you know, they get passionate, they see like an angry post on Facebook that was about their particular niche field that was wrong, and they'd want to go on a big rant, but then maybe they'd never be fueled or energized to do that ever again, but they'd have a place they could put that up. And that's when we started MostlyScience.com, and that was in 2012. And we've had about 20 different authors come and go throughout the time since then. Uh, people come in, you know, you know, and then just like just like I did back when I was an undergrad, you know, they'd be doing their masters or their PhDs. They'd write a few articles, school would get busy. So they'd drop off and then new people would come in and fill that void. And um, we kept that going for a bit. And then um, then finally this year, we actually brought back the podcast. And now we actually have a podcast with the same name as the site, Mostly Science Podcast, um, which I've already plugged and you can find it everywhere where fine podcasts are found. And but this time we went a little bit different in a way we wanted to set it up in a way that was that was going to last. So I'd seen my failed podcast in the past, I had done it, I've been doing it before, I knew what I needed, what the roadblocks were going to be, I knew what the hosting costs were going to be. So before we even launched it, so I started working on it um, a year before in 2017. And I had approached it from a direction where it, what we were going to lose tons of money on it. 
we didn't want to do it in a way where we are going to be promoting or taking advertisers that were going to compromise the science that we were doing. Um, we only wanted to we wanted to have a lot of freedom on being able to interview and ask the questions and do the kind of episodes we wanted to do. Um, and so I kind of built up a list of all the things we need, the technology, the back end, the people. And once we had all that, once I knew it was going to be in a situation and a setup to succeed, then we launched it in 2018. And that's kind of a huge, long, I know it's been a long, ranty story, but that's sort of been my journey uh, with science communication. And of course, lots of stuff on the side along the way. That's been the online SciComm. There's always not online SciComm. You brought up my TEDx talk. Um, you know, I do like doing SciComm. I've been in programs that have done, we go out into the schools. So when I was living in Vancouver, uh, for example, I was with this amazing program called Scientists in the Schools that's run out of Science World. Uh, if you are a teacher or a parent of a student who has a kid in a school in the British Columbia, I tell their teachers, get in touch with, with Science World. They will send scientists out to all the schools and they run little science programs. It's a really good way to get kids interested in STEM. Um, here in Perth, uh, for example, in Western Australia, I, I do I work with this group called the Biodiscovery Center. We have high school students come in to like a, to a real PC2 science lab and we teach them like PCR, Western blots, you know, get them excited about biological sciences. Um, I recently just did a thing called Tech Trails, uh, which is also here in Western Australia, where they put us out into um, we talked to like year nine, year 10 students. Um, and in high school, we tell them about how they can, you know, why it's exciting to pursue STEM, how STEM can help them in their jobs and their, and their lives moving forward and, you know, give them advice on how to get into that. Um, and so uh, it's always just an exciting thing. You know, STEM is an exciting field. I like to share that passion I have and excitement I have for all things science uh, with other people. And that's kind of what's fueled me for the last 15 years to continue doing this while my day job being cancer research. Those those sound like some really amazing, you know, STEM outreach programs, and you know, we, we really need those, you know, to to get kids into the, to the fold, so to speak. So, with mostly science, how how many people are you know regularly involved besides besides yourself working on the site? Um, it does vary. We do get ups and downs. Um, we definitely have. A lot more people in the, in the North American summertime where students have the summers off and they're looking to take on projects and um, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, as well as around exam time, we'll lose um, any of the, the coursework master students that are on the project. Uh, I think right now we have about seven people that help on the Facebook page. Um, they are across many continents, uh, a couple in Australia, a few in Europe, uh, some in North America. Uh, so that's always good because you get different tastes because, you know, if it was just me posting all the time, it'd be very biological and health science focused. You know, it'd be like cancer papers all the time and, you know, medicine stuff. But by, because we have different people, different interests, we get that, that sort of change, you know. So when Tim posts stuff, you know, it's very futuristic and hopeful future posts that Tim usually pushes. And um, Emma has been posting some amazing stuff um, with her free time in Europe this in the summer of the summer. Um, we have Christopher, who's been with the group for, he's a lot, he's, I think he's been with us the longest out of anyone. He joined the site like months after I launched it. He was, he was on board and he's been there ever since. Uh, he's taken time off here and there because you have to, life gets busy. He finished his PhD and he was writing his thesis and, you know, that takes time away, but he always comes back. Uh, right now, uh, because where he is in his path, where he is in his journey in science, uh, a lot of his posts tend to be about academia itself, you know, almost, um, a meta kind of analysis of this of what it is we call academic science and uh, the problems that face it too because um, science people might think of science as being a pure sort of thing but the way we practice science the people who practice science you know we're humans we have failures we have weaknesses we have biases and they get into that structure as well and he's been talking a lot about that recently because that's again that's where his passion is now and so we try to bring as many different people in from as many fields as we can. And I think that makes for a better page. It makes for a better website. Yeah, it, it does. So within the group, within our Facebook group, you know, we, we have, you know, a wide range of experience and, and talent. We, we also have a few people who are thinking of starting their own blog or their own science communication channel. And I assume, you know, 
quite a few of our listeners are going to be in that same position. So what advice do you think you can give someone who wants to start a science blog or start a science podcast or even a YouTube channel? Uh, I guess, I guess I'd, I'd say three things to that. Um, one would be make sure you can, you have the time to maintain it. Um, make sure that you have, you know, that the next eight months, nothing crazy is going to, going to happen. Um, because it can be a lot of energy and effort to start up something like this. And then three months in, you're like, ah, I'm moving, you know, I'm doing a postdoc in Germany or, you know, I'm taking on a new role somewhere else. And, and that can really put everything on hiatus really quickly. And, if, especially if you're new, any, you know, any momentum you had, you'll lose instantly. So I definitely think about planning it. Um, if you're, I don't think anyone in our channel and your group is like super, super new, but just in case some of them are, are the level, I would write some blog posts. If you're going into, let's say you want to start a science blog, I would write some science blog posts as guest posts for other people first. Make sure it's something that you actually, you know, you enjoy doing that it's not going to feel like a like a massive chore to you this is something you actually enjoy um, you know you can come to our site well you can post your stuff on mostly science and you know and if you start your own blog later you can post it again on your own blog like we don't retain like you know we don't own your content right you can you know there's lots and there's lots of communal blogs out there too um, I, you know just write a few posts without having to have the pressure of constantly writing just to make sure that it's something you like and to form your craft a little, like generate how you write, learn how you're like researching, how you like to tell your stories. Um, so those would be the, the two little things. And I guess the third is just do it, right? So this seems counterintuitive to the first point. But once you kind of have some planning, you can't plan for it to be completely perfect. You know, it'll never be perfect. And as the old kind of saying goes, done is better than perfect. Don't hold off. If you're going to start a YouTube channel, start a YouTube channel, do it, create, create that account today, you know, get your account approved so you can do videos that are longer than 15 minutes. So you can do live streaming, you know, uh, for YouTube, they require you like you have a phone number associated before you can do live streaming. Um, if you, you know, if you're going to do blogs, you know, register that domain name, install WordPress or Joomla or whatever CMS you want to install because, you know, you, you, you prefer to do your content that way. If you're, you know, if you're going to do a podcast, you know, you can you can do a podcast just with your phone. You don't need fancy microphones and, you know, condenser mics and mixers. You could do it on your phone, you know, just record, you know. And, um, you know, there's apps that can help you do that as well that are free. And I think that approach is get it done, try it once and see how it sounds, see how your storytelling goes. Just just do it. That'd be my advice. Just do it. Well, it that's sensible advice. It, it makes sense. You know, actually, for for the guest post, you know, portion, I, I have been thinking of trying to set something up within the group for those that are now starting, because I believe there are about at least five people who are interested in starting their own blogs, but haven't for one reason or the other. You know, give them that means that they can guest post on someone else. You know, they might be shy because, oh, well, I, I don't have any experience. No one will want me to write for their blog or, you know, they can write for yours so they can get something started. I don't know. Yeah, you got to get started. You got to start somewhere and you're only going to get better and you're only going to learn your own style by doing right. So it's, it's like anything in life, you know, you practice, you get better. And that's just what it comes down to. Yes. And, you know, I, I think the, the, the most important thing is that, you know, uh, you're going to grow in, in, in this process, right? You might even look back at your, your first attempts and you'll be like, well, what, what was I thinking, you know? But, you know, you just got to start, you know, and wherever that journey takes you, it, it takes you there. Yeah. And I mean, and the things that we have now didn't exist necessarily back in the day, right? Like, you couldn't really, on a zero dollar budget, do a podcast in 1996. That wasn't going to be something you could really do. Um, and you know, in ten, you know, ten years from now, you don't know what the face of SciComm is going to be like. Like in 2004, when we were running our first site, um, you know, Facebook wasn't a thing, right? It was, you know, I think Facebook started that year, but it wasn't open to every university. You needed a university email, and not every university was on their list of approved oh, yeah, ones. Yeah, that's yet. right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we start, we, we couldn't share our posts on Facebook because Facebook didn't exist. And nowadays, you couldn't possibly 
think about doing any kind of social media marketing without being on Facebook or Twitter. But that wasn't the case. And in the future, 10 years from now, that who knows what the landscape's going to be like. Um, and so you, you change with the medium, you know, and you start now and you see where it takes you. That's, that's true. So I, I think I've asked all the questions that I can think of. And it's, unless there's something else you'd like to say. Um, I guess I would like to say that one of the things I'd like to see happen more, and this is just sort of my thoughts on SciComm in general, because I just finished hosting the I Am SciComm channel last week on Twitter. And so that one had, it's got 17,000 followers. Right. How, how did that go? It went really well. I had a lot of conversations with a lot of interesting people, a lot of people excited about SciComm. Most of them are people who are just communicating their own science. So like one thing's, you know, on the podcast, that on Mostly Science Podcast, you know, I'm interviewing other people. We're learning about lots of kinds of science. A lot of people are communicating their own research. So it's a lot of scientists, SciCommers. Um, but there's definitely other people who are just professional SciCommers now that are also on that channel. And I think one thing I would like to see more of is more SciCommers supporting other SciCommers. Um, and there's a lot of people out there who seem to be like, if you're not SciCommers my way, then you're not a true SciCommer. Oh, or, you know, or some types of science communication is better than other types of science communication. And I, I and I and it forms it makes these you draw these lines in the sand and things get very I wouldn't say competitive is the right word, but it's definitely not collaborative. And I would like to, to see in the future going forward a more supportive group of science communicators. Um, I know there's lots of people out there that, like your group example, um, one that I met you in on Facebook. I don't know. I don't know if it's a private group, so I won't say the name because it. I don't know. I don't know what your settings are like, but that group is very supportive of people for sure. Um, but that's not always the case, and and I think there's lots of ways to psychom. There's people, you know, you know, um, there's people who only do that school stuff, right? There's people who only do outreach into like high schools and grade schools, and they give talks and they give presentations and they give demos, and that's how they psychom. And there's nothing wrong with that, and that's and it's a very valuable tool. And it definitely, it might even have a higher impact because your target audience ends up being these very young people, you know, you you spark that interest in the next generation, you know. And sometimes people like that don't get kind of the credit I think they deserve um, if they're not publishing in Discovery or they're not, you know, they're not, you know, the the official blogger for Science Mag. Um, Some people think like it just doesn't count. And that's not the case. And I think wherever your audience is, whoever your audience is, however, as long as you're reaching them, you're making an impact. Uh, I would like to see us more collaborative amongst all the psychomers, I guess is just what I'm trying to say. And it was something that kind of I noticed from my discussions in the channel and reading a lot of the threads. Um, I, I, was, I didn't make these comments on the Twitter channel. It's not the role of the curator of the I, I am a psychom channel to start these kind of discussions that are beca- they can become argumentative. I try, I, you know, if someone says something on those channels that I disagree with, I just sort of, you know, I just say, oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, you know, it's not, I don't, I'm not there to attack people, so I don't, um, but it's it's been an interesting week. I've definitely learned a lot. I've definitely met some amazing people too, though. I think I ended up following like 56 new people I met through the channel that I didn't know were out there doing their thing who are just absolutely amazing scientists and science communicators. So it was a great experience overall. If you are a science communicator and you're on Twitter, I recommend applying to be a curator for I am SciComm because it was it was a really good experience. Yeah. You know, um so I agree to you, science communication should be more collaborative. I I don't think we should also agree with you that, you know, we shouldn't have like this set definition of what science communication is, right? You know, for some people it's science journalism and that's that's the only way to do things. I have done a few episodes of this podcast and, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, some other of the science communicators that I've talked to have said is that, you know, when we think of science and scientists, we, we, we tend to think of a white male, right? And and that has to change. And, you know, when, when you look at the way some people communicate, you know, they use Instagram or they use Twitter, and they're mostly focused there. 
And, you know, that's, that's a great way of breaking that stereotype, you know, especially if you are a woman or you're a person of color doing science or communicating science. People see that and it smashes that perception. So, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. You know, it's like we need to find new ways of communicating what we love and showing the world what, what we do. You know, that's that's so important. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty that's pretty true. Uh, I think all the mediums, whether you're on Facebook or if you're on Instagram or Twitter, like the major social media platforms right now, um, they're not all equal in everybody. We all have different things that are our skills. And we all have things that we're not good at. You know, some people are really good speakers. You know, they're very good at communicating orally. And there's certain types of communication platforms that favor that. And there's certain platforms where people are, you know, if you can write and you can edit it again and again, and if people can tell great stories and storytellers that way, you know, you know, the authors of our world. And in that same context, some of these platforms, which seem very similar, you know, you can make a short post on Facebook, you can make a short post on Twitter, and you can write a short post on Instagram. They're not actually as created equal. And I think, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with all these social media platforms, but as someone who has been, you know, who's like myself, who's grown up with them and been on them all. And, you know, one of the nice things about my generation is like we were there as technology evolved, right? We we grew up with the evolving technology and um, they're, they lead. There's different types of success you can have on each of them for different types of people. I would from personally, I would be no one would listen to me on Instagram. I am not the kind of person that could. Uh, engage and communicate in a in, in a way that would have as much impact on Instagram as that I am able to have on, on Twitter, per se, for example. And I think yes, there's no right or wrong. You got to do what you got to do. I just I would only add the caveat that just because you can't be successful on Facebook and you can be successful on Twitter doesn't make you any less. And just because you can be super successful on Instagram and you have zero followers on Twitter doesn't mean you're not a success either right every you're all it's all it's all on impact it's all on the message you're getting across it's not about how many followers you have i guess is what i'm trying to say i agree with you you know on everything you have said so far that was kind of a rant that was kind of a rambly rant i was i was a long way to get to where i was trying to get to because like it, it requires a little bit of i realized as i was saying it that like it was a little inside baseball it was a little like oh wait if you're listening to this and you're not on twitter you may not understand how that works if you're listening to this and you're not on instagram you may not quite understand how it works but like yeah you get the gist yeah i do and hopefully i think everyone else does i, I think they will so it's very late where you are it so is. i i don't want to keep you up any any longer um, no it's all good thanks for having me and hopefully my story um will help some people finally start that blog and if you guys are looking to start your blog or you just want to practice your post somewhere, come practice it over at MostlyScience.com. That's all I'm saying. And I'll, I'll put everything in the show notes so they know where to find you and they can contact you. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And have a good night. Have a good night. That was Wes Wilson. If you'd like to learn more, you can check out his TEDx talk or his blog, Mostly Science. If you're interested in science communication, we're interested in writing for the Mostly Science blog, you should contact Wes and pitch him your idea. The links are in the show notes. The Science Bloggers is a community of science bloggers, YouTubers, and podcasters. If you're a science communicator, you should check out our Facebook group. And if you happen to be a fan of science blogs and science content, you should check out our Facebook page. I'm your host, David Latchman. If you liked this episode, consider subscribing or leaving a comment and tell us what you liked and what you'd like to see in future episodes. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you'll be with us next week when we talk to a new science communicator.